Hello and welcome to the webinar on the application of machine translation and AI to media subtitling. My name is Andrew Rufner and I'm with Amnesia Technologies. Before we go into the agenda and the presentation, a couple of administrative remarks. First of all, this webinar is being recorded. So if you have to leave the webinar early or if you want to share it with somebody else, we will be posting um, this webinar online within the next 24 hours. So you can come back and, and listen to it again. Um, in addition, I would like to make you aware of the fact that you've got the ability to ask questions. We will be doing a Q&A at the end of this presentation. Uh, in your GoToWebinar client, you will have a questions uh, section where you can ask questions and I will try to answer as many as possible um, at the end of the presentation. With that having been said, let's get straight into it. The agenda for today. So what I'd love to talk about today um, is, first of all, the challenges uh, and some of the common misconceptions related to specifically um, the machine, machine translation portion of, of subtitles. Um, so we'll talk about um, those challenges and, and some of the misconceptions and how it's being addressed. After that, I'd love to look at some of the solutions and some of the opportunities that we have that go way beyond uh, the ability to machine translate subtitles. So there's many other things that we can do with this kind of content, and we'll talk about that in uh, that particular section. We'll then go on to talk about the business case, um, obviously very interesting, and I've also got a, a real life example from one of our customers um, in, this, in this section, and then we'll um, close by having a high level look at the technology. So uh, don't worry if you're not very technical, it's not gonna be very detailed, that it should be give you giving you an overview of some of the processes and some of the technology that's being employed, and then we'll summarize it all and uh, continue with Q and A. All right, let's delve straight into it. So, one of the um, questions that I get asked quite a lot is, does machine translation actually work? Uh, and now, obviously, all of us have been growing up with um, uh, the likes of Google and some of the cloud providers providing machine translation. So we all know machine translation definitely works to give us a gist. Um, and it has gotten significantly better over the last years. The question here is really more, does machine translation work for um, real life uh, commercial use cases? And um, I'll try to answer this question throughout this presentation. And you can imagine that um, as a provider of machine translation and language, ser language processing services, my answer is most likely going to be Yes, um, but I thought I'd start with, a, with an example. Um, this is an example, it's got nothing to do with subtitles um, of a difficult domain. So this is patents and patent content, as you might know, is relatively technical. It can be anything from biotechnology through to farming, electrical or mechanical engineering or anything else that's, that's technical. And it uses a combination of technical and legalistic language. So it, it's pretty complex uh, content to translate. And at least from a European perspective, if you look at some of the more Western European language pairs, um, German to English as the language pair, um, which again is a relatively complex language pair to translate compared to some, some others. And I chose German to English uh, because most of us on this call, or all of us on this call, I assume, speak English. So you can look at the, uh, the target. And even if you don't speak English, you can definitely at least look at what you're seeing in terms of the target sentences. And what you will find, I think, if you look at some of these samples that I put up, and these are just literally examples that I pulled at random, um, is that the sentence flows quite well. Um, I mean, it, it's pretty decent English. Um, and as somebody who speaks both languages, I can also tell you that this is a pretty good translation. Um, this is not to say that this is a perfect translation. It's a machine after all, um, so it's not going to be perfect, um, but it's a very good translation. Um, there will be a level of post editing needed, certainly if you want to have it at very, very high quality. So you will have a post editor having a look at it. But all in all, this is a very, very good translation. So I think we can say uh, confidently that if we customize engines and we've got sufficient amounts of training data to train the engine on, uh, a machine can do very, very well. So this engine. Um, this particular engine that we built um, for patents, specifically for patents, um, beat um, all of the public systems that basically use more of a one-size-fits-all type of approach. 
um, if we use any one of the automated measurements. So um, you might not be familiar with all of these measurements, but Blue, Levenstein, etc., are all automated measurements. Now, this is not to say that these public systems are bad. I, I don't want to be misunderstood, but I want to be very clear. This is not to say, say that these systems are bad. What I'm trying to say here is if you customize for a particular usage, in this particular case patterns, you can get to very, very high quality levels. And again, this is due to the customization for purpose. So um, patterns are very different than children's books, which are different than subtitles. And if we want to get to very high quality levels for a particular application or use case, we have to customize. And otherwise you're going to get GIST translation, maybe a very good GIST translation, depending on the language parent domain, but still it's not going to be perfect. And just as humans, um, MT systems or machine translation systems need to have or need to be trained with domain specific data. So going back to this pattern example, if we had a biotech patent that we needed translated, um, that was very important and the patent obviously is, um, then you will get somebody who speaks both languages and has got domain expertise to translate that. And me, for example, I would be doing a pretty bad job because I wouldn't understand half the terms. And the same thing is true for the machine. If we want to get a machine to do a very good job on this type of content, we need to train it on that type of content. And that's the only way that we get machine translation to do a very high quality job. So what about subtitling then? Um, the, the common view that I've heard from a number of people in the industry and, and by far not all, but uh, quite a few, is that machine translation for subtitling doesn't work. And actually, I, I would disagree, it does work. And I'll show you throughout this presentation why. Um, but it is clear that subtitles are not easy content to translate. And out of the box, any system will fail. If you just look at the type of content that I just put a, an extract from an SRT here on the slide, SRT file, and you put that into any one of the cloud systems or Language Studio by that, for that matter, so our system, um, it will do badly. Uh, there's, there's no question about it, um, unless we tune it for a particular purpose. And there's really at a very high level, two fundamental issues when we're looking at subtitles that we need to address. If we look down at some of the technical challenges, there's a lot more, and this is definitely not easy to deal with. Um, but at a very high level, there's two fundamental issues that we need to deal with when we're trying to do a good job for this type of content. Issue number one is that we've got a lot of metadata or foreign content um, in here. So the first example that I use here is the, the time codes on this uh, 103 uh, subtitle. And if you give this to a machine as content that it's supposed to translate without any further instructions, it will fail because it will try to translate that particular content from A to B. And obviously that's not intended. So we need to do either need to mark up the content to tell the machine not to translate it or ideally we we'll strip it um, and give the machine only the content that we want it to translate. So that's issue number one. There's lots of markup or metadata. So whether it's an SRT file or a TTML or any other format, when you ingest it, um, ideally you want to strip that away. The second thing that is challenging and that we don't usually have with other types of content, so of course, as, such as for example, patents or or the type of content that we use for more general localization is that with subtitles very often we miss the end of sentence marker. Um, and if we don't have an end of sentence, um, that's for us as a human, that is very easy to find out where this sentence actually ends. So I read this as a human, I look and say, ah, oh, this is obvious, this sentence, this sentence ends here. Um, but for a machine, that's very difficult to understand where the sentence ends and where the next sentence should stop. It should start, sorry. So that lack of end of sentence makes it very difficult. Um, and then last but not least, we've got sentences split across multiple lines. And again, that's, that's the same as if I was giving you as a human um, bits of sentences to translate. If you don't get the full sentence and you don't get the full context, you will, by definition, not be able to do a very good job because you don't see the full sentence, you don't see the full context. So we can't do a good job. And the same holds true for a machine. So it ends up being a little bit like a, a game that probably most of us played as, as children, um, playing Chinese whispers, um, where we put something in on the one hand side and by the time it gets out the other, the other side, 
it's uh, pretty much total garbage. Um, and if we deal with subtitles and we don't customize the system, then that's most likely going to happen. The second challenge that we have with subtitles is language. Um, the type of language that is used um, in subtitles is different than the types of types of language that we use in more general content. So again, going back to that pattern example that we just looked at, that's very well structured language. It is uh, well written. And the types of uh, dialogues that we get in subtitles or in movies are very different. They're often short. There's colloquial language that's being used. Uh, it will use special terms potentially. So if we've got a sci-fi type of movie, uh, we might be using slang, etc. And that's very different than very difficult for a machine. So unless we train the machine on this type of content, it will not do a good job. Um, because obviously the machine doesn't know anything when we start off. So we need to train it on this type of data. But as you will see in some of the examples or in an example specifically, uh, one customer example that I'll use later on in the slides, machine translation does work for subtitles, but it requires a number of things. First of all, it requires customized ingestion of content. So whatever the source is, whether it's a TTML, an SRT, or whatever other format you may have, we need to extract that. So we only end up with the sentences and we merge those sentences together and we identify the end of sentences. So we've got one sentence and we translate it sentence by sentence, um, one by one. And then we can do a decent job. Um, we customize the engines for the domain. So the domain in this particular case, subtitling, and the language parent. And we give it terminology. Um, and by terminology, what I mean is if, for example, we've got a, a movie or a, um, a series that deals, and, and I mean, let's say US crime series, and we'll get terms like F FBI. Um, this is something the machine doesn't know. We can definitely tell it not to touch it. Or we've got sci-fi movies where we've got very specific terms that we don't see in normal day-to-day -day language. And we can tell the machine, if you see this term, then translate it that way. And that also allows us to improve the quality of the translations because we can lock in the terminology. And then last but not least, we need to do post-processing. So we've ingested uh, this content, we've merged these sentences together. And as you know, if you go from English to German or maybe even into an Asian language, the, the length of the sentence looks very different. So all of a sudden now we, we split it back out and we got particular style uh, styles that different customers want. Everybody's got their own style, and we need to basically put it back in and make sure that we you know, adhere to the reading speed and a number of other requirements. So there's quite a bit of post-processing needed here as well to ultimately make sure that what, what we return back um, is of decent quality. The end of sentence um, question that we touched on is, is really not easy um, to solve for a machine. So I just picked a random example here and a very simple sentence. Um, I could use some support right now, dot, 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 and you know what I refer to. Now, for me as a human, that's pretty simple. I just look at the next uh, subtitle and I will be very, very quickly being able to identify whether this is the end of the sentence or not. But if you look at this sentence, I could easily have additional words or additional pieces that I add on to the sentence, and it's still um, a reasonable sentence. So this is something that's not easy to do for a machine. For us, it's very easy. For a machine, it's not. And in order to make this work, we have applied quite a bit of machine learning or artificial intelligence and, uh, and statistical models combined to reliably identify the end of the sentence. Um, and I say most likely here because this is a machine. Um, so the machine will do a decent job. It will never be perfect. So if you want perfect quality, we'll need humans that review the content. But what we can do is we can process that and we can achieve significant efficiency gains. And we'll talk about that in a minute as well. But these are some of the challenges that are challenging, or these are some of the things that are difficult for a machine to do. So what's the goal of applying machine translation to subtitling? Um, number one, as I said, it works if it's done correctly. But what is it, what is it we actually want to achieve by doing it? Well, it's pretty obvious. I mean, first of all, we want to gain efficiency, so we want to do more, faster, and more consistently. Um, we do, or we let the machine do what it does well. The machine deals well with volume. Uh, if we've got huge volumes that we need to process in a short period of time, 
The machine does very, very well on that human stuff. And the machine will do about well on terminology. Um, and terminology we tend to split in the machine translation domain into what we call non-translatable terms. So this FBI example that I used earlier is something that we would lock in as a non-translatable term, basically telling the machine, you know, if you see this term, don't touch it or don't try to translate it. And then particular terms that we want consistently translated in one way. Um, consistently translating a term for a human is difficult. And specifically, if you've got a project where you've got multiple translators on it, even if you give them guidelines, it takes me time. I need to remember that this is a term that has got a very specific translation. I need to look it up. Um, I need to find the correct translation that the client wants, and I need to insert that. For me as a human, that takes a lot of time. The machine, if you, if you define it once, it will do it a million times over, and it will do it consistently. So the machine does this really, really well. What the human does really well is grammar. Uh, machines tend to make more, more mistakes on grammar. But for us, um, that's pretty obvious. We look at the sentence and we see that the, the grammar is incorrect and we can change it. That's something we see immediately. Or if we need to paraphrase equally, same thing, it's easy for us to do. So there is definitely technology available that, for example, allows uh, machines to summarize articles, but that's not really what we're talking about here. We need to paraphrase phrase or we need to actually rewrite a portion of a subtitle. That's really something that you want a human to do. And that's what we as humans do a lot better. So the key thing here really is to get efficiency gains, but it's definitely not to replace the translator. What we're trying to do is here to let the machine do what it does best and let the human do what it does best and ultimately gain um, efficiency. And that's possible. So we have seen uh, projects that have seen efficiency gains with customers of up to 300%. Now, you might look at this number go 300%. Yeah, that's quite high, and I agree with it. Um, this is under ideal conditions. So this is basically when we've got a mature engine and we've got somebody doing post-editing who actually knows how to post-edit machine translation content. Post-editing MT content or MT output is different than translating. And it takes people a while to get used to post-editing, and not everybody's equally good at doing post-editing versus translation. But... If you've got a good post editor and you've got a relatively mature engine uh, that has been trained for this type of content, these are the kinds of efficiency gains that you can achieve. And again, I'll show a customer example later on in this presentation. So we've talked about machine translation and the general challenge related to this content, but there's a number of other things that we can do with a machine when it relates to this type of content. So the first thing that we can do is uh, in the overall process that we can support with the machine is the ingestion or the, the creation of the actual subtitling. Subtitle, I'm sorry. So um, typically we start with the screenplay if it's available and uh, we extract the, the cast and the, uh, the dialogue and then we use the audiovisual content to put the timestamps against it. What we've done at the Munition is we've used artificial intelligence and we've developed a, a process that allows us to extract the dialogue from a screenplay and the cast uh, very effectively, irrespective of the, the format of that screenplay in a very short period of time. And then we tend to use the audiovisual content to give us the timestamps. Um, we've also got the ability to extract using speech to text technology, which is another AI technology, um, the, the, the text from, a, um, from the audiovisual content if the screenplay is not available. But that quality of that, it tends to be lower than extracting it from screenplay. Largely because if you've got a scene, for example, where there's a lot of background noise, uh, where even we as humans have got difficulties discerning the actual dialogue from the noise, then obviously the machine is going to have the same problem. So uh, it's a possible approach. Its quality isn't quite as good. But either way, whatever approach that you choose, there's significant efficiency gains. So the Using in this uh, missing solution, you basically got a little bit of review that you need to do. But um, I mean, the machine runs for how, for however long long that it runs, and then it's a ten to thirty minute piece of work to clean up um, the subtitle versus what typically is a couple of days of work. The next step then is obviously the source review. So if we've got the subtitle. There's a review of that actual um, uh, source, and again, that is faster if you're using MT than by doing human translation. Why? Because the machine can be locked 
in in terms of the terminology so we know that we don't really need to look at that anymore we've locked it and the machine will do that consistently on the other hand what we do have to do is we're looking at um, the actual term management if we do a machine translation we do need to manage it and again when we're talking about term management in the context of machine translation we mean both the actual terminology so consistently applying certain translations to particular terms as well as identifying what we would call non-translatable terms. So pieces of text or, 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 or abbreviations that we basically want to tell the machine, look, if you see that in the text, don't touch it. So if we look at the traditional TEP process, the pure translation portion of it, um, a human typically does about 3,000 words a day. Um, that, that number can be slightly higher, it can be slightly lower, depending on the language pair, etc. Um, but as a, as a rule of thumb, uh, 3,000 words a day is, 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 a, is a reasonable amount. Um, and if we're looking at a 90-minute movie and we assume that uh, as a rule of thumb that's about um, 6,000 words, then the machine will take um, a fraction of a minute or a couple of minutes uh, to process that type of content. It's merely a question of how much resource that you make available to it. But in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't really matter. It's done in no time. Whereas for a human, um, it's quite a bit of work um, to translate that well. So there's a clear efficiency gain in the translation step. Secondly, when we're going to go to the editing step, the post-editing step in the case of machine translation, um, that's going to be easier as well. Why? Because the machine does um, all of the terminology, so we've done the terminology work well. And it will apply consistently, which means that when I post edit, I don't need to spend all of the time to review the terminology because I know that the machine's done that consistently already. And then ultimately, when we're looking at the proofing step, the QA step, again, I don't have to review all of the terms because the machine's done that consistently, which means I get efficiency gains there as well. So the TEP process, the actual translation process, is one of the first processes where we can get quite substantial efficiency gains, but it's not the only one. Once we've got um, the, uh, the subtitle, there's obviously a number of other things that we can do. So we can um, make sure that we get consistent terminology. We've talked about that earlier on already uh, by applying uh, terms and non-translatable terms as well to make sure the machine does, does that consistently. But the other thing that we can do is we can extract what we call entities. Now, if you're not familiar uh, with the term entities, basically what this refers to is um, portions of the text that have got a particular characteristic. So this could be names, it could be company names, it could be dates, place names, what have you. There's a whole variety of different entity types and I've got a slide later on in the presentation that talks about those different entity types. But what we can do is now that we've got the subtitle, we can actually extract these entities. Now you might ask, why would I want to do that? Um, well, the reason we tend to do this for subtitles is because it gives us metadata that we can use for search engines. We're all familiar with systems that give us the ability to say, I'm looking for a movie that's, um, it's an action movie, or it's got this particular author, uh, actor in it, or it's got this particular, it, it takes place in this particular location. Um, and running entity extraction on a subtitle is one of the means to give me that kind of metadata. So what we can do very easily with the same system that we've used to translate is to extract these entities and use them to enrich the data. So if we sum it up, uh, the areas where we can apply uh, language technology in the broader sense um, to assist with processing this type of content, um, the first, first and most uh, obvious place to start, lowest hanging fruit, that we haven't really talked about earlier on in the presentation is the creation of translation memories. A lot of people are starting to add automation to their localization process by adding translation memories. Uh, and for those of you that are not familiar with translation memories, what translation memories do, they basically store uh, previous translations. And when you do a new translation, they basically try to recall as much as they can from this translation memory. So you can cut down on the amount of translation that you actually need to perform. So you got first set of efficiency gains. Um, but if you implement a TM, um, there's obviously a cost associated with that. And then after that, you need to start to fill that TM and you'll only start to see results 
or, or benefits once you've actually got content in a TM. Now you've got two ways of dealing with that. You could basically say, well, I've implemented the TM and um, I'll just start to put in all my translations and I know it's gonna take me a while until I see efficiency gains. But most people actually have got legacy translation data available. It's just not nicely aligned. It's not in a format that a TM um, can actually ingest. It might be in different documents, etc. But this is something that we can align um, using machines. Um, we specifically, and Missing do this all the time, we work a lot with the localization industry and many uh, localization industry customers have got exactly the same problem. So we get diverse content. Um, the source might be in one document, the target might be in a different document, they might have different structures, but we can extract that, we can align it and help to create TM. And the reason we would do that, want to do that, is because it basically, if I made an investment in a TM, it basically just gives me a far faster return on that particular investment. The next step that we already talked about very briefly is the subtitle creation. So um, the first thing that we need um, is to actually create a subtitle. And here again, we can use technology, and this is machine learning AI based technology largely, to extract the dialogue and the cost from the screenplay, as well as extracting um, using speech to text or automated speech recognition um, technology to extract the, the actual dialogue and the timestamps and create a raw subtitle that can then be uh, post-edited by, by a human or verified by a human. But what this does do is it massively reduces the amount of effort required. And here again, the machine does what it does best. And then last but not least, uh, we can use the, the machine to assist us with the actual translation. So by ingesting that content, um, identifying the end of sentences, merging the sentences together, actually translating it and then splitting it back out in the format that we want with a particular style that we would like. And again, there's different output formats that we can support. And there's obviously different customer style sheets. Different customers have got different requirements. But the machine can do that well. Once you tell it how to do it, it will do it consistently. Now, what about the money and the actual business case? I mean, why would you want to do that? Um, and I think the, the answer is pretty obvious to this, obviously. I mean, the first factor that is important here is time. Uh, you need less human time. Uh, obviously, we need machine time, but that's cheap. But we need a lot, lot less human time, uh, which basically reduces cost. It also provides us a potentially a faster time to market. So if we've got very high volumes that we need to process in an ideally very short period of time, and you will see again in the example that I'm going to talk about in a minute, that was actually the case, then applying this type of technology allows you to do that for sure. And we can deal with high volumes. Uh, it doesn't really matter uh, how high the volume is. Um, it's just a question of throwing um, more machines at the problem. We have got cases where we've got customers in other domains, not in subtitling, which are literally processing billions of words per month. So it's just a question of how much machine resources you throw at the problem. And secondly, um, capital. Obviously, we want to reduce the cost. And by increasing efficiency, we do re reduce cost. We need less human time, so there's a cost reduction right there. There's improved consistency, which affects quality. So by using the, the terminology capabilities that the machine has had and the whole post-processing of the data, um, we can make sure that the content and terms are applied consistently, which is a lot more difficult to do for humans. And ultimately, for some types of customers, we've also seen that it allows them to access deals that they might not otherwise be able to access. So if you're a smaller, uh, if you're a smaller shop and you're getting the opportunity to actually bid on a large um, project with a lot of volume, um, this gives you the ability to actually do that. Um, and it's not necessarily out of reach anymore because the amount of human effort that you need to uh, apply is a lot lower than if you needed to do everything with humans. So I talked about a real life example and I would like to point out maybe before I talk about this particular example that on our website, we've both got um, references up as well as a white paper that discusses um, the subtitling um, issue specifically in a lot more detail with the business case. Um, around it. So if you're interested in 
looking at the reference or um, reading a little bit more about how we actually deal with this in a little bit more detail, then please head over to the Omnisian website and look at either the references there or the white paper. But here's a, a, a real life example from one of our customers in Southeast Asia. And the reason I picked this uh, particular example is because I wanted to, for this webinar, pick a very challenging example. This is really an example of um, a case that is a lot more complex than most other cases that we see. But I wanted to pick something more difficult um, so that you can actually see that even with a pretty difficult starting position, if it's done well, um, we can definitely achieve great results. So the challenge here really was that this customer had very high volume. Uh, they were entering new geographical markets in very short periods of time, and they needed to get a base set of volume um, localized in a very short period of time. So little time um, to actually provide that content, which also obviously also meant as a consequence, little time for us to build an engine and little time for us to actually build or handle this particular project. The other thing, the other challenge that we here had is we had limited funding, not to say that we had little funding, but we had limited. There was not a big part of funding available um, that could be used to do everything um, with humans. So we had limited funding available as well. We were dealing with low resource languages. And what I mean by low, low resource languages are really languages for which there is less data available online um, that you can use to build a basic engine. If you're in Europe and you're trying to do something for a European language, there are a variety of sources available these days that you can get open source data, training data to build a basic engine with. That's not particularly difficult. Customizing it is always, obviously always is, but you can find training data. For languages like Vietnamese or Bengali or Nepali, which are some of the languages that we did, or Swahili even, um, there's not a lot of training data that you can find. So your starting, your starting point is pretty difficult already. And then of course, given that this is a, this were new GS that this customer is going into, they had no training data that they could give us day one to build an engine with. So if you're looking at this from a machine translation provider's perspective, this is probably the most challenging starting position that you can get. You got no data from the customer that you can use to train something. You've got a low resource language and you've got very limited amount of time available to you to actually build something. But the advantage that we had here is that we had a very knowledgeable customer um, that knew the challenges that they had. They understood the process. They were able to work together with us to define a process that worked really well around this type of problem so that ultimately both sides of the house understood what the challenges were and how we could actually address this together. And that's the only reason that we succeeded by having somebody on the other side of the table as well that worked with us effectively to overcome these challenges and overcome them we did. So the approach that we, ch that we chose here is really to initially and quickly gather as much data that we could. Uh, so we went out and we gathered as much data that we could find just to build a very basic rough first engine for those particular language pairs. Some of these language pairs were actually language pairs that we'd never done before. But we also very importantly defined an automated workflow um, that would um, pull together the project managers and the translators and define an automated workflow as to how we actually take uh, subtitles, how we translate them and how we get those post edits back to us so we can start to create an improvement cycle. And then we retrain the engine very, very quickly once we actually had those post edits. So here's um, three examples of engines um, that we built. And there's a couple of other ones, but it, I just picked three randomly. So we got English Arabic, English Thai, and English Vietnamese. And what you will see is you look, if you look at that table, you see this, the, we've got a version number of the engines of the first version, we've got the blue score. You saw those numbers that you see there, so it's one of the automatic scoring mechanisms. And, and you will see very quickly that on the version one, we were, depending on the language pair, roughly a par with some of the large cloud providers. So we pulled something together very, very quickly. We managed to get roughly at par. Um, so in the case of Arabic, we were you know, a little bit better than Bing, not quite as good as Google. And in other cases, we're, we're better, but it doesn't really matter. We were roughly at par. 
But then the key thing really is, as soon as we got those post edits back, we started retraining very, very quickly. And in the case of Arabic, for example, you see that the Arabic engine jumped from seven, from a blue score of seven to 17 in one single step. And that's just by applying um, a couple of weeks worth of post edits that we had there. So we managed to get that quality to ramp up very quickly. These particular engines, because of the limited amount of data that was available, were based on what we call statistical machine translation for those of you that are more interested in the technology. Um, and then later on, and that's not in this table anymore, we managed to switch those two to neural, uh, which is an AI based technology. And then all of a sudden the fluency increases a lot more and the quality gets even better, but neural needs a lot more training data. So we had to start initially with statistical and then move to neural at a later stage. But what this basically exemplifies here is that how quickly you can, even from a very, very challenging starting position, if you focus, get to quite a reasonable quality and a quite a decent ROI. So the blue scores, by the way, um, that are in there really don't take any of the pre-post processing into, into account. That was really just a raw uh, full sentence that we translated and that we then compared against some of the other systems. Uh, it's also important to point out here that um, blue is not blue. So there's different uh, algorithms that are used for blue and um, the blue score is also very much dependent on the actual um, test set that you use. So don't take this blue score from this presentation and compare it to something else that somebody else gives you that's really comparing apples with pears. You have to run it, all of the content with the same test set. But as I said, we saw that the customization provided improved quality very, very quickly. And obviously the pace at which we could uh, do those improvements were dependent on how, how much volume was actually processed and how quickly we managed to get those post edits back. We also ran quite an extensive ROI analysis um, on this particular project um, with um, this customer. And it was very obvious that this uh, ROI was way under a year. It was actually closer to half a year. Um, depending on the language, but most of them are close to half a year in terms of the ROI. So that basically showed us that within one fiscal year, we could achieve an ROI that's very positive. Okay, so the technology, let's look a little bit and uh, take a little bit of a look at the technology that is used here. And <clears throat> before I go into the technology that we use for the different portions of the different tasks that we perform, let me take a step back quickly and give you a bit of an idea of what Language Studio does. So Language Studio is our platform um, that is available both as a cloud-based solution as well as an on-premise solution. And it combines a whole range of technologies. So from a translation perspective, which you see on the top, it provides rules, which is the kind of things that we use for terminology, uh, we use for formatting data, we use for non-translatable terms, etc. It uses statistical machine translation technology, which is a somewhat older technology in machine translation, but that does a lot more, a lot better if you've got very little training data uh, or if your domain is very broad. Um, and then we also include in that platform, obviously neural, which is more of an AI based technology. Actually, we're running deep neural at the moment. And then many of the same tactical um, capabilities as well. On the right-hand side, you see all of the language processing capabilities. So in addition to actually translating all of the things, we also support a very wide range of NLP capabilities, whether it is simple recognition of what kind of language like it is that we're looking at, to entity extraction that we talked about, to sentiment analysis and a whole host of other things. And if you're interested in um, some of the NLP functions of Language Studio, I would invite you to go and look at uh, our website and as at least some of them are listed there. We've got a very um, flexible process and workflow, and this is really what enables all of this pre-processing that we talked about earlier. So stripping the content out, identifying the end of sentence, um, but then also on the post-processing, when we actually put it together and create a subtitling file again, the, the workflow is really what, what empowers that. Um, so the workflow allows um, applying all of this linguistic processing, all of the language processing. It also allows handing out or going out and, and connect, contacting third-party platforms. So an example of that would be not from the subtitling domain is we did a lot of uh, translations for TripAdvisor of hotel reviews. So what they would do is in, in, in countries where 
they didn't have a lot of reviews in local language. They would take the uh, US English reviews and they would actually localize them. So as an example, in Thailand, they would take the US English ones and would translate them to Thai. But in that content, of course, you've also got, um, for example, car uh, currency, somebody might refer to what they paid for a hotel or for a meal, and they would use US dollars, which is not relevant to a local audience. So we would use entity extraction to recognize the entity currency, and we would then on the fly go out to xe.com in real time, trans translate um, that US dollar amount to Thai baht, reinsert it into the content and then translate so that by the time you get the output, it's localized to the local audience. Um, we've got machine learning capabilities for broader machine learning use cases. And then very important on the other side of this slide is, is all of the data uh, repositories and data manufacturing capabilities. Over the last 10 plus years, our business really has been in building very bespoke and specific um, engines and workflows for customers. And that's the reason why we've got all of the capabilities to do what we need to do uh, with subtitles. And the fact that we've got a lot of data, historical data that we can use for training, but we've also got the ability to manufacture data is what allowed us to do this project that we just talked about. So starting with no data and literally in a matter of weeks, um, create an engine that does quite decently um, to start off with, that all is built around the data manufacturing capabilities and the data repository that we have. So let's look at the process here. <clears throat> If we look at the actual translation uh, portion of this process, uh, what we do here is we, we take the original source and we ingest it. We talked about that earlier on, so stripping away all of the metadata, merging the sentences back together. And then we machine translate it with our um, customized engine, which gives us raw machine translated output. That then gets handed off to a post editor, a uh, human, which post edits that. Uh, that output and then ultimately gives that, that post edited subtitle. Now that content is valuable to us in, in a number of ways. Obviously we want to use that post edited output to then split it back out and create uh, the subtitle that, that we ultimately provide as a result. But this data also gets fed back straight, straight back into the engine to improve the engine so the engine can on an incremental basis learn from the human post edits, and that's how the engine gets better. And as it gets better, that's how your ROI or your efficiency improves. There's also ways, by the way, which is sort of indicated in gray here to do that in real time. Um, but the requirement, if you want to do that in real time, is that the system's up 24-7. Uh, we talked about extraction of named entities, and here's an overview of um, entities that are currently supported in Language Studio. Now, not all of those entities are obviously relevant um, to media type of content, but entities like you know products, persons, dates, locations, etc., are definitely relevant. And we can extract that from the data and then we can start to enrich it if we like. And again, if you want to have a look at this in a little bit more detail on our website, uh, these entities are actually listed. So we can then start to extract these entities. And we talked about this earlier on as well. And here's an example. So we can extract the entities and this might be people, it might be dates, it might be um, uh, company names, locations, etc. And then if we want to, we can start to enrich those as well. And I'll talk about that in a second. And the other thing obviously that we can do here is we can lock in the terms. So you see CNN mentioned there as a company name, for example, by doing the terms and the non-translatable terms uh, when we prepare the engine. Uh, we would probably want to tell the system that uh, CNN is one of the terms we don't want it to, to try to translate. So that would be something that we call a non-translatable term. We can then start to enrich and categorize the data. So what we did here is we took from the uh, autopsy series, um, one of which was on Michael Jackson, we took the subtitle and we basically ran it through the system and we categorized it and we tried to extract concepts. So you see the categories here and you see a, a confidence score that the machine gives you back as well. So you can also define where you want to cut off. Um, and it will identify things such as, for example, uh, you know, Jackson family, Michael Jackson, that's one of the Afri uh, African-American families, etc. cetera. Um, it also identifies concepts. So uh, in this particular series, obviously, this is all about Michael Jackson's health and appearance. 
Um, and because this series also talks about a lot of people that were involved at the time with Michael Jackson, it's obviously got to do with personal relationships as well. And the system managed to extract those concepts and, and list them up, obviously, with a, with a confidence score. So we can automatically, using the subtitle, not only uh, identify entities, but we can also categorize it. We can extract concepts from it. And then last but not least, um, if we look at the entities, we can actually start to categorize them as well. So here's a couple of entities that we managed to extract. Um, and you see, for example, Michael Jackson and if, how he fits into in a number of categories. But you can also see that there's, uh, there's talk about uh, cardiac arrest and um, that's then being categorized as uh, diseases, di uh, disorders, symptoms, causes of death. Um, now, this is metadata that we can use. Uh, we don't have to use it, but the, what I'm trying to show here is that by using the subtitle differently and, and, and mining it, we can create quite a rich amount of met metadata that we can use if we want to, um, to um, power search. And last but not least, we can also use artificial intelligence to do image or video analysis. So we've talked about uh, dialogue knowledge analysis uh, throughout the presentation. We talked about named entity recognition. We talked about enrichment uh, thereof. But we can, of course, since we've got audiovisual content, also look at the actual um, image. And here's just this very simple example uh, of an image that we ran um, analytics on using AI. And what you see is that the machine gives you back um, concepts that it recognizes. So in this particular picture, it recognizes the fact that it's a dinosaur. It recognizes a bicycle. Um, it recognizes it a dinosaurus and so on. And it gives us a confidence score. And then we can decide what we want to do with this data. So we could ultimately recognize that there's a movie that's got a lot of cars in it, whatever. But the bottom line of it is we can start to use the, the machine to recognize a lot of that metadata and provide that back to us. And we can then ultimately decide what we want to do with that. So there's a lot more that we can do with this type of content than merely translate. So to summarize, um, it's definitely true that uh, generic machine translation is not suited for subtitling, which is the common view. Um, but I think the misconception here is that that's the only form of machine translation that's available. Um, and I hope what I've been managed to, what I've managed to prove with this presentation is that if you customize for this particular use case, um, then you can um, deliver a feasible solution that has got a very clear and positive ROI. So a subtitling machine translation works, but it doesn't work with a generic system. And again, whether you using one of the cloud service providers, or you even use Language Studio. If you just chuck an SRT file straight into it and you don't tell the system what to do, it will fail. So we really need a customized approach to this type of content. Um, but machine translation of the localization portion of it is really only one of the uh, machine learning applications that we can apply. There's a number of other ones, and I've hoped I've been able to show you a couple of other applications that we can use to extract metadata um, and enrich the result of what we get. So we can apply it to subtitle creation by using AI and automated speech recognition. We can create metadata, we can do video analysis, the whole host of other things that we can do with uh, the data that we have. Uh, that is very, very difficult to do at scale for humans. But ultimately, whether this is relevant uh, for you and whether you can actually apply this effectively really depends on two key factors. First of all, it's obviously important to understand the technology and the process and its limitations. As with any technology, technology has got its limitations and it's important to understand what the technology can do and what it cannot do. And that will give us boundaries as to where we can actually apply it. And secondly, um, we need to look at the business processes and make sure that it actually fits into those business processes really well so that when we actually do apply it, that we can provide a benefit. And that's going to be different from organization to organization. But I hope that what I've been able to show um, with this presentation is that there's a variety of tools that we can have in a tool chest that we can apply. 
And with that, I'd like to thank you for your time. Um, and we're going to head off into the Q&A section. So I'm going to have a look and see uh, whether we've got any questions here. Um, so let me see. Uh, There's a question here rela related to um, uh, whether a subtitle could become a, a good post editor. And that's actually a very good question. Um, I think we can look at, at the localization, the broader localization industry here and learn from them as well. Um, and not everybody who's a translator um, is a good, good post editor. Some translators hate good post editing, others love it. And it's definitely something, it's a skill. It's something that you need to learn. It's not the same thing as translating. So there's, there's ways that you can be, become a lot more effective uh, if you're doing post editing. Um, you can definitely use a translator to do post editing. Um, and we've done that in a number of projects. Um, but ideally you give them a couple of guidelines and you will ultimately think you will find that some people uh, prefer to do post editing and other people um, hate it. Um, but there's, there's, there's tools and there's processes that you can employ to make people a lot more effective when they're doing post editing, because uh, it is a, is a, is a specific um, skill. The second question is whether you can take an unlimited amount of source files um, uh, or text with no, without timing. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it really depends on what we're trying to do uh, in terms of the process, but uh, if we're looking at the localization, side of it, yeah, definitely. I mean, it doesn't really matter what format the source is in as long as we can read it and extract the text. Um, and in the case of SRTs or TTMLs, we just need to know how to convert them. So if you've got a very specific use case here, what I'd like to suggest is that you um, contact uh, our team. We're definitely happy to talk about a very specific use case. But generally speaking, yes, I mean, we can ingest a whole variety of different formats. And we do that for uh, more general localization projects, whether these um, plain text, XML, uh, HTML, word formats, what have you, uh, we can definitely ingest uh, a variety of formats. There's a good question here is on, on how we're actually manage, man, measuring the efficiency gain. Um, this, um, I mean, ultimately it comes down to, to the amount of time and human effort that's being spent. So if you look at it, the pure efficiency, it's it's looking at the process and comparing the process and uh, doing it human only versus human and machine. Um, and in many cases, if you're doing human and machine and you not you haven't done that before, you might want to adjust the process a little bit to make sure that you make your post editors more effective. But at the end of the day, um, what we really uh, are comparing is the time spent. And then obviously we want to also make sure that the, the quality that we get as an end result is at least the same, if not better. There is a question here as it, as it, in terms of how long it takes to get the, uh, the engine to the point where it, um, it does really well. Now, um, this is a, a somewhat more difficult question um, to answer it because it really depends very much on the, on the language pair. Uh, and, the, uh, the, and as a consequence, as I mentioned earlier throughout the presentation, the amount of training data that's available. So if we've got a language pair for which we've got quite a lot of um, training data available, then we can get a first version of the engine that actually does really well. Um, if you're dealing with a low resource language, and I mentioned one of the, um, the more challenging ones that we did, for example, which was Swahili, you just don't have a lot of training data. So then it's going to take a little bit longer. And it also depends on the amount on the, on the, on the engine technology that we use. But um, if you've got a very specific use case, I would definitely suggest that, that we talk. Many of the European languages, there's more than enough uh, training data available, um, as there is for many of the big Asian languages. Once you start to go into lower resource languages, it probably needs to be looked at on a case-by-case -case basis. But that's a very good question. Um, there's a question here as to how whether the creation of metadata enhances neural machine translation, and the answer to that is no. Um, the metadata that we create here in these processes is really intended in many cases to enrich the actual uh, search engines. So recommendation engine search engines, we want to enrich those 
uh, so we can do better recommendations to users as to what what to do. It doesn't doesn't enhance the uh, the neural machine translation. There's a question um, here on the difference between statistical and neural machine translation, and um, while this is a very very good question, um, this is something that I can't answer very very quickly. But what I would suggest is if you're interested in differences between different translation technologies, please head over to our website and look at the uh, the webinars. Um, we had a number of recent webinars on this particular subject comparing statistical and neural, and then also looking at neural in very specific uh, use cases. And these, those webinar recordings are up on the web. Um, and I would hope that they provide um, an initial answer. And if you need more, then please do reach out. Um, there's a question here as to whether we are providing the post-editing environment and tools. Um, the answer to that at the moment is no. Um, and then we had also a couple of questions related to um, speech to text. So one of the questions here was whether um, the speech to text technology was ours. And the answer to that is no. Um, what we build ourselves is we build all of the language processing technology, all of the machine translation technology, the entire workflow. Um, and more generic AI technologies, but speech to text is a very um, unique capability. Uh, and that's one of the domains where we partner with different partners, depending on the language pair. However, um, what the speech to text engine will give you is not what you can use right out of the box. So what we've done is when, when we looked at those processes and what I actually presented to here is we then built an entire process around it that allows the speech to text engine and the ultimate workflow to provide a good result. So in many cases, we iterate through speech to text a number of times um, to ultimately get very good results. And there's quite a lot of uh, uh, post-processing from our, from our end that is applied here as well to ultimately make this, this workflow work. So as I said, I mean, I don't want to go into any level of technical details, but once you start to drill down, it, it, it can become quite, uh, quite complex. And with that, um, we have gotten to the end of all of the questions. So I would thank, like to thank you once more, once again, for all for attending the webinar. Um, if you've got any more questions, please do not uh, hesitate to reach out. Um, at the bottom of the presentation, you see our email contacts as well as all of the social media contacts. I would also like to point out um, that if you head over to our website, we're also organizing uh, in, in early March a three-day virtual conference, which is going to have a number of customer presentations on, on um, media subtitling um, as well. So if you're interested in this, this, please do head over and do register for that conference as well. Um, it's free of charge and you will not only hear us talking, but you will definitely also hear people from the research community and the customers talking again. All right. Well, once again, thank you very much for attending and goodbye.